And now for software quality, as I said, I'm not an expert on that. I have brought an expert from Obo Academy. Marta Olszewska is a PhD in computer science and she works with software quality on a daily basis. So I guess she's well equipped to tell you something about that. You already know a bit uh, and pieces of quality assurance. So you have seen what is the debugging about. You have got some hints about the testing, but not, that's not all that you can have in quality assurance actually. So uh, there, there are some models and standards that have to be kept. It's usually in larger companies or in uh, companies that are producing safety critical systems like cars or some space shuttles. So all the code has to comply to certain standards. We are not going to go that far, but we are going to stumble across quality metrics. They are basically here we focus on code and for the design. Quality metrics are there for understanding the code. So it's not only what you read, but also how the things work together. Quality metrics, what they do is that they measure the quality of your code. The errors that you find while testing or debugging, they can also be uh, reported when you have been using metrics. So the design flaws can be reported there. What we will be looking at today is the static code analysis and the structural quality. They are basically saying how good or bad is your code. Then we have the numbers and then the charts that either of them can represent the metrics. For plenty of metrics, you have thresholds. So the values that if you go over the border, then it means that that sucks a lot. And then we have metric violations, which can be set, for example, for certain projects. And then you encounter a violation, you have to do something about it. Who, when, and where should use them? Basically, hopefully you, throughout the entire development. So it's not that you just have a checkpoint at some time and then you skip the rest, but you, you should continuously check the quality of your code. One thing, the debugging and the testing helps you to produce the code that runs and hopefully is somehow along the expectations of your customer. Quality metrics, they can also be used for your customer, although nowadays they are something like a bonus for him. They are of most value for yourself and the team that you're working in or the company that you're working within because it's out of respect, you can guarantee the maintainability of code. So not only finding bugs is important, but if you think about if you have a software and you want to extend it, it evolves, you put some new features there to be developed, and then it occurs that it's really hard to change your software. So you have to propagate the changes like all over the structure of your software. That makes quite a big difference when you have a well-structured code. If you need to reuse your code, it's not only that it's readable for yourself and well-documented, but it's also that it's well-structured. If you share your code with your friends, colleagues, whoever, and then another thing, if you're working within a team, if your code is good, then it will be a pleasure for your colleagues to work with it. And nowadays, thinking larger scale, maybe not like, like a classroom, but more industry-related topic, the distributed system development, having some team in US, India, wherever, and if the code is really messy, it will be really time-consuming and hard to manage it. So quality metrics can help you there. The goal of using metrics is to discover bad trends early and then give some suggestions for improvement. That's something that most of you know, lines of code or kilo lines of code. It's not the most fortunate metric maybe, but at least it's the first one and well known. Then of course you can count the number of classes, packages, methods, libraries, whatever that gives you some wake idea about the size of your project. And then uh, what we are going to look at today is the complexity of code, in particular the cyclomatic complexity and the code dependencies, so how the code is structured. We will use the metrics of Chinamber and Kemmerer. These are the object-oriented metrics. And then we have Robert C. Martin. These are also object-oriented metrics, but for the dependencies. So the first one, the cyclomatic complexity, is basically when you see your software, you can see it as how it executes. So there are some certain paths that the program takes in order to run. The values for the complexity for this metric are if you have a single path, it just run, like runs linearly through the, through the execution. It's just like complexity of one. Basically, it almost does not happen. But if you add some if statement, the complexity goes to two. But if you have this if statement, like if then else, then it goes four. So you can see that it really can rise really high. Everything is kind of very much related. So Miki was talking about the testing. This metric is very common for the testing. This one is a very basic one, but you can have various types of it for hardware, for example, or for some networks on chip, whatever. Basically, you can see it as a number of test cases that are required when you want to achieve full test coverage for your program, for yourself. 
And uh, the good thing is that whichever quality metric tool you use, this is basically by default implemented there, so you can have it for free. The good thing is that there's a threshold for that, so whenever your code is exceeding the value 15 for the cyclomatic complexity, then you should get yourself concerned. As trivia, a few years ago, this threshold was still 10, which means that the, this kind of the number of requirements and then the complexity of nowadays systems is basically also on the rise, so also the thresholds have to be pushed. Then the next metrics are the dependency metrics. So you can have a look at what are the dependencies between the members of classes of a package, packages, children of package tree, and then libraries. These will tell you about the, how good is your design, and also will tell you if maybe you should have a second look at your code and uh, take a look what can be changed there so that it's easier to read and easier to use for others. The object-oriented metrics that Chidam and, and Camera, there are six of them. They are quite simple, actually, but they can tell you a lot. The first one, weighted method count, can be treated as a predictor how much time and effort is required to develop and maintain a class. So basically, when you have a class, you are counting the methods within. Of course, if a class contains plenty, plenty of methods, then it means it will be very hard to maintain it and very hard to change it. So the threshold that is given there is between 20 and 50. It may also change for the requirements for certain projects, but basically if you stick to these values, it's fine. The second one is, um, ah, the thing is that if you have the value very, very high, then you have to restructure your class to a few smaller ones so that there are not so many methods packed inside. The second metric within this GDAMR and camera package is the depth of inheritance tree. So if you see your system as uh, classes that inherit things, that's the depth of how deep the inheritance goes from the root class. The greater the hierarchy, the more complex, so you have to dig in more and more. And luckily there's a threshold for that as well. It's five. Sometimes it might be eight if the project is really, really large. If you think about inheritance as such, you can not only structure your code, but also manage complexity in, in such sense, not to increase it. This kind of metric promotes the reuse of methods. This is a count, so number of children from certain class. You look at the breadth of class hierarchy from a subclass. When you have high value for the number of children, it engages plenty of things like high reuse of base class. Inheritance is like a form of reuse. The base class may require more testing because it has plenty of dependents. It may also mean that there's an improper abstraction of the parent class, so the contents of it have to be lifted even one level up. It might be necessary to group the related classes and introduce another level of inheritance. As I said, you have to push it a little higher. And then there's a golden rule. Hopefully you're familiar with it, with the favoring composition over inheritance. So you don't like build the layers one after another, but you make classes work together within one layer more. The good thing is that not only the metrics themselves tell you a story about your code, but the relation between the metric can enrich your story even further. So if you have high weighted method class and number of children, which means that uh, your class is very rich in functionality, but it also has plenty of subclasses, the complexity is very large at the top class and it will be really hard to maintain it. Whatever you do in your higher class will have impact on the classes below, so you have the ripple effect that you have to handle. This can be a sign of poor design and unfortunately some refactoring or redesign might be required at that point. And then uh, the classes higher up in the hierarchy should have more subclasses than that are lower down. The fourth one, uh, response for a class, it's about the communication between classes. So it's the number of methods in the set. Since you have quite intensive communication, you can have more faults. You probably might want to test it more extensively. The worst thing about it is that it's much harder to understand and debug and test. So actually this tells you quite a lot from the functional point of view. This is quite familiar, hopefully, for you, the coupling between objects. So it's the number of classes to which a class is coupled, meaning that the class that is kind of talking to other classes. And uh, we have threshold for that. When you have such a big communication between the items there, it prevents the reuse because everything has its links and you have to be careful what kind of links are you looking at. It stands against modular design, and then again you have this creeping in the ripple effect that if you put some change in one place, you will have to do it in plenty of other. It's quite likely that you will forget some places. And then the metric that goes somewhat together with the previous one, the lack of cohesion of methods. It's about the functionality and grouping it together in one place. 
so that the module as such is performing a single task. Basically that it has the same set of variables. If you have a non-cohesive class, that means that it performs more or two unrelated functions. That means that you should divide it so that it has this kind of monolithic functions separated. So that it needs two or more smaller classes. These two work together quite well. And if you have a look at their relation, what you want to get is the low coupling, so that there's not so much of communication, less probability of faults, and high cohesion, so all the functionality is like packed in one place. That makes your maintainability higher, so that when you do the changes, they are not being so much propagated, you can control them, and uh, you don't have to change here and there and have the ripple effect there. And of course that promotes the reusability, so others can reuse your code and not worry about the links that if they use this part, they will have to use another, and if they change this part, they will have to look for the changes in another one. Then there are some package metrics by Robert C. Martin. Uh, there is a stable abstractions principle. It, it sounds very, very high, but it helps you to strive for good design. And it's quite simple, actually. There are two package measures that the matrix is based on. There is an abstractness of a package. Uh, it expresses the proportion of abstract types towards the rest. And then there's a stability, so that the package is used by other artifacts, which it means that it's stable. And so that means high in the hierarchy of your system. Or it may depend on the other artifacts, which is unstable, that on the lowest level of closer to execution. A package should be as abstract as it is stable, so these two are related again. If one would think that there are some packages that, that are used very heavily by the rest of application, meaning that they are on, on the top of the hierarchy, and then they have low degree of abstraction, so they have a lot of stuff that can be executed there, so they should not be that high, so it means like they are contradicting like high level of abstraction, and then at the same time, very much of executable things. They should be like somewhere in the middle then. And then you have to have a look how to change them. From these two, you can compute the distance. The picture will follow, it will give you a better idea. I will skip that slide and go directly for the, for the visuals. It gives you much better impression. From the metric, you have the instability and then abstractness on the axis. And then there's a main sequence, the line here. So at the best is when your metric is grouped around this axis here. That's why the bubbles are green, it means like it's great. But then the further it goes from it, then it means that something is really fishy, that either the class is too abstract but too stable at the same time. You have the two zones. One is called a zone of pain, and then the other one, zone of uselessness. And then the zone of pain here means that Okay, you have stable stuff there, but it's too concrete. So basically, it will be really hard to change things and really hard to maintain. And then on the upper right corner, you have zone of fuselessness, meaning that, okay, you have some very highly abstract things, but nothing depends on it. So why they are even there? Why would you need them? And then there are metrics that are based on cycles or graphs. And uh, cycles are the things that you want to avoid in your development. So if you have dependency cycles within your design layer, think again. You can have it for the libraries, packages, packages tree. If you don't take care of that early, you will have this kind of, uh, it's called rotting design, meaning that the maintainability will suck like large and you will have serious problems later on. If you have cycles, just refactor. So you remove the dependency. You reverse it, so if it goes like downwards for the more concrete parts, just reverse the dependency. Tangles are actually very much related to cycles. It's like home of cycles. So every cycle lies in a tangle, and every tangle consists of just cycles. You want to really take care of that. If there are some tangles, you have trouble, because you have cycles. Just take care of them. The easiest way of seeing the problem is that if you look for the edges in your design that point to the wrong direction, and then the easiest solution is to check the one that it's easiest to be reversed. That's actually the last slide, and it's not the totally newest version of what tools are there for checking software quality. But uh, plenty of them are open source, and plenty of them are easy to use. The big one and quite easy to use is the, the JDepend. This tree is from 2012, so plenty of things could have happened, but it was the most comprehensive one that I could find and the most readable one that I could find. What we want to show you today, there's on the lower right corner, there's this stun tool. So it says here that it's commercial, but actually it's not commercial unless you have a system that is over 500 classes. And it gives you really good visuals for your project. 
of course, it computes metrics for you. You don't have to worry about what is the maths behind it, or what are the cycles, or what are the graph theory, or whatever. So it's basically like a big facilitator for you.